This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit like and subscribe, whatever you're listening on. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists for the night from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King, Ball State, Ball State athlete, Paul Havocott, and from Steelers Nation South, Rollo Coffin. We're joined here tonight by a special guest. He went to college right here, USF. We're, we're all in the Tampa area, so love that. Um, he's Go Bulls! That's right. Go Bulls. Professional tennis player, 161 wins, five titles. Um, and our debate tonight is the men's greatest upset, and it's something that he has done himself because this man took out Pete Sampras. I'm sure we'll talk about that later on in our Q&A for could, him, of course. It, it could be on the list. could be on the list. But it could be because I was straight sets too. But and I want to make sure everybody check out this guy's documentary. It, it, it's, uh, let's just say, parental discretion advised. But yes. uh, it's pretty good, so check it out if you can. Um, it, there's some clips of it on YouTube and, and Google, of course, as well. But so we've got a uh, retired tennis player here from the New Mexico Sports Hall of Fame. We got Mark Kyle. Mark, thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm uh, glad to be here. Aloha. I'm in Beverly Hills at my friend's house, uh, enjoying life this weekend. Awesome. Nice. So let's move into our bait tonight. As I said, it's the greatest men's upset of all time. And if you like upsets and you like tennis, go back in our archives. So we have the greatest women's upset with Ann White. Very good show. Um, but we're going to start out tonight with the year 2013. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, yeah, I went with a 2013 match. And in this one, you have a number three ranked Swiss legend. And then you have Stakowski, who was ranked 116th. And ultimately in this match, the uh, underdog really won here, kind of weathered the storm. There was some, you know, there's a tiebreaker opportunity, and uh, Federer made an uncharacteristic error. Stakowski, who was playing without a coach, and that's a key here, sees this opportunity, ended up beating him in the second round. And so listen to kind of what he upset here. Federer had suffered, this is the first loss since 2005 that Federer had lost to a player ranked outside the top 100. Uh, 2005, he lost to Monte Carlo. And he was on a quest to capture a record-setting eighth title at Wimbledon, and it just basically came to an abrupt end because a virtually unknown Sergei Stokowski uh, ended up beating the superstar in the second round. For Stokowski, this was his first win against a top-10 opponent in his long career. Um he, t- he t- uh, 27 year old turned pro back in 2003. He had never advanced past the second round of Wimbledon, but sit- did so against Roger Federer and, and beat that. And and one thing I wanted to add here, so I thought this was kind of an interesting note. Um, I watched some clips where Sergei is actually serving in the Ukraine military. At least he was as of a year ago, and he was doing an interview when he was in Eve. So that was an interesting kind of career turn for him. But yeah, that's my upset. And I think that the things I wanted to highlight were. This guy did it without a coach and did it against a legend in Roger Federer. All our matches will be legends tonight, which is what makes it the upset, of course. But, Mark, I come to you. Uh, you know, first serve returns is very important in tennis. And in this match, you know, Stakowski, he was doing pretty well with that. And on the career, they both have 27%, which is actually kind of low for Roger. I was surprised to see that. But what were your thoughts on this match? I mean, it's it was uh, one of the biggest upsets in Wimbledon history, in tennis history. Uh, I mean, he was uh, the score was six seven seven six seven five seven six. Uh, I mean, he was a, the guy is a beanpole of a guy, real thin, uh, you know, trail kind of looking, and uh, he was a serving volleyer. That's all he did, even on another surface. He was a total serving volleyer player. And, you know, at, even at that time in 13, there wasn't many serving volleyers. And uh, he just did that to – and I think that I remember watching that match. I think that kind of upset him, Federer, because he wasn't used to playing just a guy coming in on first serves and second serves. But, um, yeah, that's that's what I remember from the match. And now, you know, he, I think he's still in the Army. Uh, like uh, our colleague said, uh, for the Ukraine, which is crazy. You know, I don't know what he's doing over there. I wish him the best, but uh, I don't know if I'd want to do that. I don't care. You know, I love my U.S., but just going over there, and I think he's fighting for uh, Ukraine. Is this one bigger because it was Wimbledon? Uh, out, of the, out of the four that we're talking about? 
Well, just, I mean, is it more amplified because it happened at Wimbledon? Yes, I, I think so, in my opinion, because it's that's the most prestigious and the biggest tournament in the world, uh, you know. Uh, but still, if it's on the ATP Tour or, or yeah, I still feel like it's major. This is when the top players are their most serious. Not that they're not, you know, they're still professional everywhere they go. But at Wimbledon, yeah, I think it's uh, – it escalates the, uh, you know, because it's because because the tournament is more in the uh, public eye than the other events. So let's keep moving back in time here. Let's go 2009. All right, we got Sorling versus Rafa Nadal. This is May 31st, 2009. Um, prior to this match, um, Nadal had beaten Sorling three times, including three weeks before, six one six zero. At the ATP Masters in Rome, the King of Clay. <clears throat> what can I say? From 2005 to 2008, he was 131 and four on clay surfaces, 97 percent win percentage. <clears throat> in that year, going into uh, the French Open, he was 24 and one. Um, but in terms of the 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 rankings, it's not gonna. It's not like it was that bad. Because Sarling was was the twenty fifth ranked player, he was a pretty decent player, but he had never been past the fourth round in any major. And Rafa Rafa <clears throat> had won four straight French Opens and thirty one overall on 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 clay surfaces. <clears throat> um, what makes this even more egregious is that he had Rafa had won the French Open nine out of the ten years that he was from two thousand. Five to 2014. The only one that he didn't win was the year that he lost to Sorling. So that type of dominance over so many years and just to lose that one in the fourth round, that to me makes this a much bigger upset simply because of how dominant he was on his surface. That's that's the doll surface. He's known as the king of clay. <clears throat> so Mark, what what makes him so dominant on clay? Wow, just his physical prowess, just growing up on it in Mallorca, uh, just his movement and his forehand, the massive amount of spin he puts on that forehand, that left the RPM has never been ever in the history of tennis. No one has ever seen it. The ball just takes off and jumps up, and his mental mental fortitude is just unmatched. He plays every point like he's going to die, and he's a lefty. And uh, he moves well. He's a strong guy. And he's just mentally just so there every point. And nothing other, nothing ever, ever bothers him. And uh, he just moves so well on the clay. And uh, that forehand, though, just set, you know, he sets it up for that. That forehand is, is the best forehand in the history of tennis, in my opinion. So with Soderling being ranked 25, if this had happened on a grass court or – are we even discussing it? Is it because it's clay that this is so shocking, in your opinion? That's a great point by uh, what the, the gentleman said. Uh, uh, great point that it was on clay. Yeah, I mean, you can't – yeah, because, I mean, he has, he's won 14, and, and, and you know, you win 14 on clay. Uh, may, uh, French Opens, I mean, that was his best surface. So, definitely, I mean, it would still be a big topic, you know, but not as uh, – it, it could be the best – biggest upset in the history of of tennis but we got to look back in the Bill Tilden days and the Gottfried von Kram you never know what was going on in Don Budge's head either one right. thing to add Martina Navratilova called it the biggest upset of all time so add all right, that yeah. too all right, all right. Yeah, that's all the right. problem <laughs> we'll see if that helps you when we vote here yeah, great well, let's point. go to uh 2002 all right so we're going back 2002 Wimbledon tournament we got George Bastille versus Pete Sampras. So, I mean, Pete Sampras was all, you know, one of the greatest players in tennis history. No-brainer uh, induction into the Hall of Fame in 2007. He was completely dominant on the grass at Wimbledon. Now, how dominant? Well, he holds the open-era record at Wimbledon with a 90% court match winning percentage. 63 wins to just seven losses. Now, on the other hand, we got George Bastille. Uh, you know, he had only he had only won three singles titles up to that point, and they were all on the carpet, and none of them were grand slams. Uh, he was at 145 in the ATP rankings wow. and, you know, looked to just be another speed bump footnote in Pete Sampras' illustrious career. But to his credit, Bastel came to play that day. 
Uh, what makes this upset even more incredibly remarkable outside of the lopsided resumes is the way we arrived at the matchup itself. George Fastel wasn't even supposed to be there. He lost in the final round of qualifying to Alexander Waski, but snuck into the tournament after Felix Mantia was forced to withdraw from the field during uh, due to injury. So when the match began, Bastille, he took it to the six-time ATP Player of the Year, uh, taking the first two sets. And then with the heart of a champion, Sampras, he battled back. Uh, he evened the score, even the match at two to two. To two. Uh, but most fans probably felt like Bastille's tennis, best tennis was probably behind him in this match. But he was able to prevail six to four in the final set to shock the world. Uh, Bastille would go on to lose the next tournament match, and and he was never able to you know get to Sampras's level uh, uh, you know again during the rest of his career. While Sampras would go on to end up winning the U U.S. Open over his longtime rival Andre Agassi before retiring the next year. So just an incredible, incredible uh, upset for Bastille. So, Mark, this – actually, that whole summer, Sampras was not dominating. The, he wasn't the dominant Sampras that, that we remember. Um, I, I know that he had a pretty poor summer. I think he he, uh, he lost at Cincinnati to a 70th-ranked player. He did come back and win the U.S. Open. He had brought his old coach back. But what were your thoughts when this occurred, and is it maybe in your opinion that – Sampras was just kind of approaching the end and coasting through. Well, this hurts me dearly. It hurts me dearly because I'm really, when I went to USF, go Bulls, we just talked about it. And this can, people who are listening who live in the Tampa Bay area can relate. I uh, played there for two and a half years before I went on the tour. And uh, then Don Barr recruited this guy from Switzerland named George Bassel. And he went to USF for two years. And then uh, he transferred to USC, and then he got to the finals of the NCAA singles. So when I was on the tour, I used to practice with George at USF, and he came over to my house. And this was after I had beaten Sampras. So uh, he went up to me, man, and he really bothered me. But he's a really nice guy. So he'd come over, we'd have a couple beers and uh, discuss. You know, he was like, wasn't really happy at USF and wanted to change, so he transferred. And uh, so, you know, but at that time, he, he you know, there's only a few players uh, considered uh, for the Hall of Fame, I think, for USF. But so then, so I knew him pretty well. And then he, and then, and then, and then we talk about the Sampras match. And then, you know, a few years later, he, 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 uh, he goes off and he does one better than me. But we were, so I knew him. I had never known Pete before I beat him on grass in 91 so I knew George we had a relationship I knew him we practiced he was a good guy from Switzerland strong great hockey player this really as a kid but this stamp this match was you know what he's lucky loser but he did break the top 100 uh and uh he's a fellow bull but I you know I'm trying to be I think I'm the goat of USF because he transferred that's not fair he transferred and he went to USC and he can I even asked him he goes I can consider the Trojan but uh, no, but he, you know, he he really played well that day. Uh, that was a that was a, uh, uh, you know, he won six three six two four six three six. He was up two sets to love, and then Sampras came back and then went to six four in the fifth. And uh, you know, he could have choked any time, you know, in, in the fifth set because Sampras was coming back. Um, but uh, you know, it's his biggest win of his career, and he was ranked one forty five. But he got the top hundred, and incidentally. Uh, when we played on the tour, I got to the finals of a uh, doubles ATP tour event in Uzbekistan, and he got to the finals of the singles. And there was two guys from USF, you know, in the finals of an ATP tour event for four. And so people don't know that he went to USF, but uh, he, he did transfer. But uh, great guy, great player. And this is, uh, I still think, uh, I think uh, this could be, you know, at Wimbledon, you know, this could be uh, one of the best ever. I, I, I I, I can't decide. It's, it's too close of margins, guys. Well, let's move into our final one tonight, and that's also going to be our oldest one. So we're going to August 29th, 1983. Uh, yes, I was alive for this, in case you're wondering. <laughs> John McEnroe versus Bill Scanlon. Just to give you a little bit of a picture here, McEnroe has 78 titles and seven Grand Slams. Scanlon has seven titles and zero Grand Slams. So that's just the paint a little picture here for you, but 
before this match, McEnroe, he had beat Scanlon six times, and he would beat him another two times after this match. So the, the record is definitely in McEnroe's favor. Um, this matchup's at the U.S. Open, so it is one of the, 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 uh, the, the slams here. Uh, we got number one seed, McEnroe. He was also ranked number one in the world at that time. Um, and he's up against Bill Scanlon, who came in unseated to this matchup. Um, this was an American versus American on U.S. soil. So, you know, that added a little more into it. Um, and the sets were 7-6, seven, 7-6, six, seven, six, four, six, six, four. So there was a lot, if, if you go back and watch some of this match, Vintage, let's just say vintage McEnroe was going on in this one. Um, the crowd in New York was actually backing Scanlon, and and this this pissed McEnroe off a lot because he grew up 15 minutes from 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 the stadium there, so he wasn't happy about that right off the bat. And and everyone knows how McEnroe can act on the court, but um, he he was throwing complaints about the crowd, the umpires, the lines people, the noise, the. The, the head and, and, and even planes that were overhead, he was complaining about in this match. So he was throwing every excuse out there that he could in, in vintage, uh, you know, McEnroe style. Um, but looking at the stats, he, he just wasn't that good that day. 14 unforced errors. Ten times he double faulted. That That's a huge percentage, especially for him. And he only won 51% of his first serves. Um, so the numbers just weren't there. It's obvious why he lost um but you know this this is the match remembered from the the 83 US Open and this was the first time since 1977 that McIntyre uh or I'm sorry McEnroe he didn't make it to the semifinals uh, at, at the Open there so big match Mark did did his temper get the best of him well his temper did but he also out of all the players that McEnroe ever played in his career and I know this for a fact everyone he had played the ones that he you know, he disliked Lendl immensely, disliked Connors. There was no one even close to how much he hated. <laughs> Rest in peace, Bill Scanlon, who just passed away a couple of years ago. Rest in peace. He disliked Mr. Scanlon more than anybody. He got under, and it went all the way back to juniors. And he got under his skin, Scanlon, and even wrote a book called uh, Bad News, uh, Bad News for McEnroe, which is a great book. I read it. I recommend it. Bill Scanlon wrote this book, Bad News for McEnroe, and they just they could they they totally did not like each other. And there were three, you know, they had to remove three guys, shirtless spectators, yes. for shouting during points during the match. And uh, you know, Scanlon, uh, you know, the umpire warned Scanlon warned back for uh, trying to hit him during the match twice, and he actually did hit him from a litter, from close range. So it was yeah. such a such. I think Mac finally found someone who could get under his skin more than anybody, and just out of all the people, he did not like Bill Scanlon at all. They wouldn't even talk. It was it was much worse than Lendl and 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 uh, and Connors. So I think that 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 was that was uh, that was uh, one of the main reasons he just they just it was a total total hatred. And there, there's a, if anyone has access to NewYorkTimes.com, I mean, everyone has the internet, but yeah, you have to be subscribed on it. There is a fantastic article they have on there from 1983 after this match. And I highly suggest reading it if you're, if you want to know more about this match. Really good article, but let's move into our vote tonight. Guys cannot vote for your own. Brian, who are you taking? I mean, I feel like the McElroy one, he kind of imploded. And then the, <laughs> The Nadal one, I mean, it, it was still a pretty quality guy that, you know, that upset him. But, I mean, to, to go and to win without a coach, without having that guy in your corner, I got to give it to the dude that took out Federer. I mean, that's – that. I give that guy some mad props for that. All right. Paul. Yeah, so Brian's got a great point. And, by the way, I want to call out Mark. When I was describing my match, I specifically left the scores off, and Mark rattled them off. Did you guys know this? Notice this six seven seven six seven five seven six. He rattled them off from memory, so I would vote for Brian's his Sampras upset because I, I guess if I can't pick my own, that's the closest one I think to mine. I think you're right, Brian. I think McEnroe just imploded and caused it to himself. So I'm going with yours because it's similar to mine. Rallo. 
I was going to go with Sampras, but then I just looked this up. Federer had been to 36 straight quarterfinals in Grand Slam matches before that match. He's legendary. Yeah. So, yeah, that got to go with that one. Yeah, and for me, this is this is prime Federer. This isn't Federer like three, four years ago. Like, he was still – he was the greatest player in the game, you know, maybe an adult, but at, at that time. So I'm also going to take Federer. Mark? I'm going with my USF buddy, my USF uh... – he didn't graduate there. I'm still the goat. <laughs> no, I'm going to go for Bassett. He was, he was he was the uh, he was the uh, uh, you know lucky loser. You know, lucky loser coming in taking down Pete. You know, that's my 145 and love the Bulls. That's why. There you go. So two votes for the upset there on Sampras and three votes for the upset on Federer. So the win does go to Federer. Let's move into our Q and A. Paul, you got the win. Yeah, this is an easy question, and this is the one you can only ask if you win because everybody would want this question. But when you beat Pete Sampras, I just want you to describe like how that changed your life, what things were like before and after compared to that. Was that – I mean, are you chasing that moment the rest of your life to feel like that again? Thanks for the question. Nice to meet you guys. This is a great day, great night. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, like I said, I went to USF in, in the late – Mid, in mid '80s, I was ranked uh, 100 in the nation in the 18s and eight in doubles, and that. So I didn't wasn't really a highly recruited player. I got a full ride. Bill Perrin gave it to me, and then I just improved in summers. I played the futures, and then I left college ranked 267. I got a sponsor, a, fem- a teammate of mine's dad was wealthy. And he, get, he he sponsored me to go on the tour for a few years, and then it took a while though. But you know, I was 24 when I beat him, and and I had d- done well in doubles too. I was about 200 in doubles and. 224 in singles, but I I had been out there for four years, and I was thinking to myself, something's got to happen quick, or you know, I'm going to go back and get a real get finish my degree and get a real job. And uh, you know, qualifying, I beat three British guys in qualies, three sets, each of them, and then I beat a two guys, one guy, Patrick Bauer, top hundred first round at Queens, three sets. So I played twelve, I played uh, yeah, twelve sets of tennis on the grass, and I think Pete just got there, and it was. It was the best moment of my life. It was on live on BBC. Yeah, it, it definitely made me realize that I could, I could probably, st- that I belonged on the ATP tour. I ended up eventually becoming a double special. So I had my opportunity. I had main draws of ten challengers. After that, I jumped up to one sixty seven. I just didn't win a match for that whole summer after June, July, August, and so I was. That was really a bummer. So my t- singles evolution stopped, but then I started to do well in doubles. And I got top 50 in the world in doubles. And then I ended up playing another, you know, I got my pension with the ATP through doubles. Because if you finish top 60 in doubles uh, for five years, doesn't have to be consecutive. Or top 150 in singles uh, doesn't have to be consecutive. You get a pension for 20 years from from 49 to 69, a monthly pension. So I got that in the doubles. But it would have been nice to crack the top 100. It was the, the best, you know, and I'm, you know, I had a nice Swedish wife. But it was the best day of my life. Yes. We'll go Rollo, Brian, me. Mark, you kind of touched on it a little bit about your doubles career. You you were very successful in, in doubles competition. How did you go about picking your partners? Did you guys, you know, talk on the phone? Did you meet at matches and says, hey, let's let's pair up? How did you go about picking your partners for doubles? It's changed a lot. Uh, there's some positives of back when I played and negatives and positives now and negatives. Uh, basically, back then, it was all doubles rankings were separate from singles rankings. You had a doubles ranking, and, and I, I just felt like there was more teams. So I, I broke in with Dave Randall, and we played a couple challengers, and we won them, and then, and then we got an opportunity. We actually they used to have – doubles qualities of some tour events and we did well in Philly and then we got a wild card into Scottsdale and then we won it and then we were top 100 but but just by success then we started we, we decided to stay together but then again the romance faded you know you had a couple we had we, we you know we played together for a few years we really should have stuck it out and uh but by picking partners it's all what you, who you can get in with it's it's a computer it's all com- there's 16 teams in each week so if you and your partner when you combine your rankings aren't one of the top 16 or actually 13 because they have wild cards uh then 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 you don't get in so you're just trying to get into the event 
Uh, nowadays, it's all singles. Rank- I hope this makes sense, what I've been saying. But now the, nowadays, it's singles rankings that they use for doubles. It's one ranking. And if you're like 40 in singles, that counts. You know, And you don't play singles, you can get into an event. And that's why I think if doubles has gotten weaker. But then I also think singles players are just better tennis players than 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 the doubles guys. They're just better, they're, you know, they're just fitter, they're just better players, but still it's a totally different game. But I guess hopefully I answered your question. It was just who you can get in a tournament with at each level, futures, challengers, and then the big team. And if you're having success, you stick together. All right, Mark, I, I got a hypothetical question for you, sort of piggybacking on what Rollo said. Let's say you have a championship doubles match coming up against the Bryan brothers. You could pick any player in history to be your partner. Who are you taking and why? In history. <laughs> I'm going to go with, I mean, it's a standard answer. You know who I'm going to pick. Uh, but I played the ad side, so I don't know. Mostly, I was better on the ad side. Johnny Mack or I need a deuce court player, you know, uh, Robert Seguso from Florida down there. He was tough, man. But uh, I'm going to go with Johnny Mack. And I like that. He's my, he was my idol growing up. Nice. Nice. So I'm um, looking here at your stats for your career. Uh, the differences between grass, hard, and carpets. It, it looks like a little bit better on carpet, but uh, you know, what was your favorite surface to play on, and and what was the hardest for you to play on? Clay was the hardest because I was a Sherman volleyer growing up in Albuquerque. It's high altitude, uh, but I enjoyed it. I played German club tennis. I had a German passport, so I counted as a German. And at the time, that was huge because you're only allowed to have one foreigner on your team. So I made some pretty good cash for a six-week season. Uh, but I actually did win a tournament with Tarango on clay. We, we split a hundred grand. It was a million dollar event in Bucharest. Uh, I loved indoors. I liked indoor. I won a title with, with Peter Nieborg in uh, Federer's hometown in Basel. That was great, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I would say grass was my favorite because of obviously the Sampras and just, uh, I didn't win a grass court doubles title, but I but uh, I, I did okay in, 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 in mix there and, and in doubles. Same more, guys. One more. Hey, Mark, I'd give you a chance here to plug your journeyman documentary. And my question was about that. After all these years looking back on that, is there anything that you wish you would have included in there that you didn't? Or conversely, anything that was in there that you wish wasn't? (laughs) I shouldn't have made the film. Didn't make me look very good. No, but uh, (laughs) uh, if you've seen it, uh, it, no, it was a catharsis project at the end of my career. I had done well for 10 years. At the end there, I was getting divorced. I was partying too much. Uh, my ranking dropped out of the top 100, but I but I loved film, and I needed a hobby, and I wanted – so Jeff and I did this film, and we were fortunate enough that, that, that someone actually took our footage and made it, and it was aired in 11 countries. You can get it now on Vimeo. Uh, Vimeo, uh, you can purchase it for a couple bucks. I still have it out there. But uh, if I, I would have – Added, I would have liked to add in more of the training part, the off court that we were doing. We were still were training off court. I don't think I showed enough how hard it is and difficult it is, and what we were doing. I should have added more of the weightlifting and the running and the plyometrics that people do. I don't know if I was doing enough of it at the end there. And what would I have left out? I would have left out the vulgar vulgarity. Now I'm 56. I, I you know, I, I would have left out the drinking. I had a beer driving a car. I would have left that out. So uh, you know, in the language. And, if, and, and and then maybe the philandering with the women. Go ahead, Rolla. So this is kind of a two-part question. So after the Sampras win, did the women, did more women come around? Oh, uh, it was interesting. No, it was great. I, I, I got I to admit, uh, it was, it was, you know, being at USF was, was, was great. It's a nice place. Being an athlete there. I was obviously much fitter than I am now, but it was nice. The attention was great. But then on the tour, it was just, to me, it was a different level. I was happy to be there, you know, because you have a player party during the week. Uh, every week you go, and it's kind of a big deal in each city, even from the futures, challengers to the tour. Every level was was cool. Obviously, at the higher level, it was just it was just more, more opportunities. And 
Uh, I ended up meeting a beautiful Swedish woman. I married her. It didn't, it didn't end great, but uh, definitely it was, it was something nice. You just had the opportunity. There was nice women. Uh, it wasn't like groupies, like, and they were more high class, I think, than other professional sports. I'm not trying to, you know, downgrade other, <laughs> but, you know, tennis tournaments, they have the girls working there that are working in the tents in the back and they're selling stuff. And then you go out in the town in Vienna and you're meeting people that are, you know, and they come to the player part and it's just higher class of uh, females. And it was great for uh, 12 years. It was the Roman empire. Unfortunately, it's not the same now, but that it was great. It was a great opportunity. It, it was a lot of fun. So Mark and men's tennis today, I mean, we, we finally just recently saw Roger Federer retire. Uh, the other two from the big three, Nadal and Djokovic, they're nearing the finish line. Uh, who do you see taking over the reins in the next few years and becoming the new face of men's tennis? Well, uh, that's a great question. I don't think it's going to be one guy. I think it's going to be a few guys. I don't think they'll ever be the same. Like, like there will be another four, like Alcaraz, Sinner. Uh, but the one guy that I think is going to do the most damage is, is, is I think as of right now is Alcaraz. I just watched him. He won Queens. The guy's an all court player. Uh, center impresses me a lot. The Rune kid is good. Titsy pass, you know, he's loving life. He's got a really nice girlfriend and now he's just beat Murray. He just couldn't be, I mean, his, he, he's doing a lot better than me right now. Titsy pass with his girlfriend and, and then round of 16 at the at Wimbledon. But, yeah, I'd say Sitsipas, Rune, you know, the one guy, though, would be Alcaraz. Nice. So uh, I'm going to take you back here in time a little bit. 92, 93, back-to-back -back champion at Scottsdale with Dave Randall. What what worked for you there in, uh, in Arizona, and, and what worked so well with Dave Randall? Dave Randall, the best tennis player ever to come out of the state of Mississippi. There's another guy, Devin Brighton, who won Junior Wimbledon and the NCAAs at Ole Miss. But I think Dave etches them out professionally. Uh, there's a female that was uh, T.J. Middleton's wife. Uh, he played on the tour. She was top 200. But I, I, I go with Dave. I like Dave. Uh, Dave Randall, good guy from Ole Miss. He would hit people off the return on the deuce side with his return. He would hit it so hard. He used to hold the racket like you're riding a motorcycle on the return. One Left hand on the like, like it was like this. It was like you have. It was like a motorcycle, like you're riding the motorcycle. That's how he held the racket with the with the big head on the left side, and he would just spank the hell out of it. And uh, we actually played Philly the week before Scottsdale, and we qualified and and won a round, beat caught, uh, and then we lost to Connor Michibata, and then we flew to to Arizona thinking we were going to get in. We were about 150, both of us ATP, and then I talked to. Gus Sampras, who was a tournament director, Pete's brother, and said, hey, you know, no one had asked for a wild card. And I told him I had grown up in that section, which was which I grew up in New Mexico, and they gave us the wild card, and then we won the tournament. So we took advantage of the opportunity. And then after that, we went down to the Lipton, got to the quarters. Our ranking got us in there. So it was it was great to win it in my section because I really felt good because, I, you know, I played junior, junior sectionals in Phoenix, and, uh, and Dave was just – Soft-spoken, religious guy from Ole Miss. He's a tennis director at a club in right now in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. So if you ever go through Jackson, you got to go take a lesson from good old Dave Randall. He 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 actually had a great singles win. I think he, he beat Muster, uh, uh, and, and he played Connors uh, at the LA Open. He qualified, so he was a good singles player too. He's not the best out of Ole Miss. There's been a lot of good players like Mahesh Bhupati. But he's the best person that grew up, I think, in, in 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 the history of tennis for men or women in the state of Mississippi. Southern guy, and we just did well. We just clicked. We just clicked. Uh, I played the ad side. He was a deuce guy, and uh, we were told a little bit opposites off the court. Uh, but that's okay. You know, we just were business, and and we won a couple titles, and it was great. And then we came back and won it. My mom came and watched. She lives still in Albuquerque. It was a lot of fun, and. Uh, I like going back to Scottsdale. My mom lives in that area, though, now, so I sometimes drive by that hotel. They don't have the facility there anymore at the uh, tournament site, and it's not an existent, the tournament. Yeah, that was a hard court, wasn't it? Back yes, then? sir. Yeah, it was. Yes, That's sir. what I thought. Yeah. Well, I want to thank our guest, Mark Kyle, for coming on. Very knowledgeable. Thank you so much for being here. 
thank you guys. You guys are knowledgeable. Loved it. Loved it. Go, go Bulls. Go Bucks. I was a Bucks fan. Tampa was. I lived there for twelve years. College and uh, I was based out on Hunter's Green. I was a touring pro. Loved it. Loved living in Tampa. Well, I'll remind everybody if you get a chance, check out that documentary. It's 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 definitely worth a watch and and very interesting. You're going to learn some stuff behind the scenes stuff of what, what's going on in locker rooms and things like that. So it's, it's definitely worth a watch. And I remind everybody, hit like and subscribe on whatever you're listening to this show on. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.